Without these two gentlemen and Kathy Black, uh, this conference would not be happening. So let's give them a big round of applause for our guys. Really, really, all of the uh, uh, logistics and everything else, you all are really taken care of. Jesse McCarran uh, uh, is a local guy, grew up here in Portland, Oregon, and uh, went off to college back east somewhere at Williams, and then uh, did his medical school training at Vanderbilt, was it? No, Penn. Penn excuse me, Penn. Um, and then residency at Vanderbilt. Why, where no, is that? Oh, I, I got you. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Vanderbilt, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, residency at Dr. GW. Shano did. GW, residency at GW. Came back here to uh, uh, Portland where he was at the Veterans Administration Hospital uh, for 10 years or so. Is it not right? Uh, Nine? 10 years, but it was only six. Six years. Okay. I know him well. <laughs> and, and, uh, and then he joined us at Rebound not too long ago. Jesse still holds an appointment uh, at OHSU uh, uh, doing academic work and teaching. Um, and focuses on reconstructive shoulder surgery. Uh, next to me is Dr. Brian Regal, who many of you know as well. Brian has really helped to organize this conference, and I would say that uh, for the last three years, this, this conference has really been the, brain, the brainchild of Dr. Regal. Dr. Regal is also a local boy. He went to Benson Polytechnic High School, one of their fine graduates there, then off to become an Oregon State Beaver, um, then OHSU for medical school, briefly thought he might want to be an orthopedic surgeon. Boo. And then got his mind straight off and ended up doing neurosurgery. Went off to the University of Utah for a while. Then uh, uh, Brian uh, served in the United States Air Force, um, uh, was working in Afghanistan, uh, taking care of our soldiers there, as well as uh, the local people afflicted uh, uh, in the war there. Uh, we were lucky enough in Portland to have him come back here to the community. Uh, he worked with me at OHSU for a number of years. Uh, and then uh, was in Missouri for a brief time, uh, but couldn't get couldn't get back to Oregon fast enough, uh, and to Southwest Washington fast enough, and joined us at Rebound several years ago. Jesse uh, McCarran and uh, Brian Regal are going to talk to us today about that age-old dilemma, is it the neck or is it the shoulder? Gentlemen. All right, so we're, we're just going to pass this mic back and forth. I think that'll be easier. Um, so. You know, we struggle with the same thing you guys do. Um, almost 100% of my patients with shoulder problems who show up in my clinic are also complaining at least to some degree of involvement to the neck. Uh, and um, as we all know, oftentimes some of this neck pathology will radiate down into the arm. Uh, and it can be hard to sort out what the primary cause is or if they're actually two separate things both coexisting at the same time and feeding into each other. And uh, it's really common in our practice to have to trade patients back and forth. Uh, and I can actually say, since coming to Rebound, where I'm in a practice where I now have neurosurgeons that are in the same practice with me. This has made my life much easier and much more enjoyable because it is, it is so much easier to share and collaborate amongst people who are really still part of the same team uh, because there are a lot of people that I do need to send to our back specialist, either our neurosurgeons or, or our physiatrists, to figure out how much of this is really the neck that's causing things and how much of this is something in the shoulder that I should be fixing. Um, <clears throat> this is the last talk of the day. After we're done here, we'll all go over across the uh, pavilion right here to our uh, rebound uh, clinics. Uh, where we'll go over physical exam and pearls and tips for joint injections. So uh, we hope that you'll all join us here. Um, this has been a lot of fun. This is the third year we've put this on. Um, we've really enjoyed it every year. We really appreciate the fact that all of you are willing to come and spend your Saturday hanging out with us. Uh, and we hope that this has be, been valuable enough for you guys that you'll consider coming again next year, because we'll be certainly putting it on next year, and we hope we'll be seeing you here. Uh, so the talk we're going to give uh, is actually uh, one single patient whose story spreads over several years. Uh, so that will come through uh, as the main sort of underlying line uh, through this talk. Uh, I'm going to pass this off to Brian so he can start the story, uh, and we will uh, we'll get this going. It is, it is nice to share the pain of patients with other people, as you all know. Um, but differentiating between uh, cervical spine and shoulder can be confusing. In general, I think Jesse and I um, would agree, if you palpate the shoulder and it hurts, it's probably the shoulder. If it goes all the way to the hand, it's probably the neck. So pinched nerve in the neck will oftentimes go all the way to the hand. 
Uh, if you palpate their shoulder anterior posterior capsule, it oftentimes uh, will hurt, and that's probably the shoulder. The big confusion is, is our uh, aging population, is they oftentimes have a little bit of both. Their shoulders, their joints, they'll all be painful everywhere you touch. And so this particular patient was one of those cases where it was not clear up front. But differentiating between shoulder and pathology, specifically a C5 uh, pinched nerve in the neck, uh, can be very confusing. And we're all wired about the same uh, in terms of a dermatologic pattern for a pinched nerve in the neck will follow a very similar pattern for all of us, but we can be off uh, by about one. So a C6 nerve root pattern to me, which will come down the arm and go to the thumb, might only go to the shoulder in some people. But there's seven bones in the cervical spine. They're numbered one through seven. And what the difference is, is that there's eight nerve roots, though. And so the first nerve root comes out between the base of the skull and that uh, uh, arch of C1. And so that's where the numbering gets a little confusing. Because in the cervical spine, the nerve root that exits the foramina is above the vertebral body. So for example, the C5 nerve root will exit above the C5 vertebral body unlike the thoracic and lumbar spine, because then there's, there's not a C7, but there's a C8, and then below that it goes T1. So that's where things get a little bit more straightforward. So an L5 nerve root will come out underneath the L5 pedicle. But in terms of the cervical spine, the C5 and C6 nerve roots, which is specific for uh, differentiating between a pinch nerve in the neck and shoulder, will come out between the C45 and C56 uh, foramina. And as we get older, we all get a little rusty. So what only makes sense for Jesse and I and others in surgery is we have to match up with what's rusty with what's squeaking. So if it's a left-sided if it's a left-sided squeak, I got to look on the left side and fix something on the left. Unfortunately, when we get these reports back, everything looks rusty uh, to us on an X-ray, which is depicted here. Unlike the previous X-ray, now we we have some bone spurning, some osteophyte formation. And so over the years, as we age, our joints look a little rusty. So I oftentimes, the first thing I mention to patients when they come in with the report is, you know, we, we all have birthdays. Because of that, we all get older and we get a little rusty. And, and then I say, your x-ray looks age appropriate. And then I try to frame it in terms of where they're at with their age. Age appropriate, younger than steady age, and then maybe a little bit more than stated age. But these are the typical patterns that we'll find. And specifically for the shoulder, the C4, C5, and C6 can get a little confusing. Uh, but in general, if the pain radiates down and gets into the thumb or gets into the hand, that's going to be a pinched nerve in the neck most often than not, and not, not necessarily the shoulder. And I like this um, particular paper because it, it went over the nerve roots and the dermatomes uh, and as well. But the, the one that we're talking about today is the C5 uh, nerve. But it will get the pain, the myotome, um, it'll get into the pec in the supraspinatus. It's, this is all shoulder region pain, discomfort. And oftentimes patients won't come in and tell you exactly where, very hard to uh, verbalize pain for a lot of people. But one thing that I found very consistent, if you ask them just to point to it, ask them to draw a pattern with their hand, they're very good at drawing myotomes. They're very good at drawing dermatomes. So if they, if they draw it down their hand and they get into their thumb, you know, it's, it's more often than not going to be a, a C5-6 problem, so I'll focus in when I look at the MRIs and the imaging modalities in terms of uh, trying to help focus my exam. Because the reality is we all have to see more patients every day than less, so my time over the years with patients has just done nothing but diminish. Before when I first started, you know, we had maybe 45 minutes to see a new patient. Now it's down to about 20 to 30. So I really have to focus things pretty quickly in terms of guiding which way we're going to go pretty quickly. And I found if I just ask them to point to it, just ask them to draw it, it seems to key things in a little bit quicker. So the rotator cuff you see here. And this gets into, if you palpate the shoulder, it oftentimes is the shoulder. But this is a 41-year-old male, about four weeks of low neck pain. I um, differentiate between high, mid, and low neck pain just to kind of help my mind key back in when I see him next. I can't tell you that clinically that makes a big difference to me overall, but I tend to say low neck pain when it tends to localize to the kind of the T1 spinous process and maybe the C7 spinous process and then out into the upper trapezius. So when I see that and I read that with my own dictations, that's what I mean by that. And then writing it into the right scapula and shoulder uh, and then all the red flags we ask, motor weakness, imbalance, bowel and bladder were all negative. And then had really, to this date, had tried everything. And 
And when the patients come to us, this is what we recommend. We recommend that they're willing to try chiropractor, go for it. It turns out that um, the, if you look at consumer reports, if you look at the annuals of the internal medicine, this is what patients love and do and it, what helps them get better. Um, so I always ask if they're doing any of this stuff and I encourage them to do so if they have not because it beats a knife. But full strength, mild tenderness in the anterior shoulder capsule and then the x-ray uh, show just as mild, mild to moderate degenerative changes. One, two, three, we would expect uh, that nerve to exit to get into the, uh, uh, to be the C4, C5 nerve. Two, three, four, five, six. You can see at five, six, there's a little bit of bone spurring here compared to the other levels, a little bit of loss of disc height. And this does bear out on the uh, sagittal T2 weighted MRI, T, uh, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. A bit of a disc, degenerative disc there. And then the spinal cord, you lose a little bit of the anterior aspect of the cerebral spinal fluid. It doesn't mean a ton unless there's, um, unless there's a raging radic, so I can't necessarily recommend surgery at this point, just because he's not complaining of uh, symptoms that go all the way to the hand. And then be, based upon the uh, exam with some minimal tenderness in the shoulder capsule, um, I always uh, recommend maybe starting with at least looking into having their shoulder looked at. But these are the initial non-surgical managements mechanisms. And in this, uh, in this particular case, we're really unclear if it was shoulder versus a C6 radic or C5 radic. Uh, patient wanted to try acupuncture and epidural steroid injection, which we encouraged. We offered a referral to, to uh, one of our shoulder specialists at that time, and he, and he declined at that time. So this is where Jesse gets involved. Thanks, Brian. So <clears throat> just a little uh, refresher on shoulder anatomy. Uh, we're looking at the bony structure of the shoulder here in the upper right corner. Uh, you've got uh, the scapula, the clavicle, and the humerus, which make up the shoulder complex. Um, the uh, scapula here is seen end on from the lateral side. This pear uh, shape here is the glenoid socket with the surrounding labrum. And then uh, external to that, you have the joint capsule. Um, the shoulder architecture from a bony standpoint is a lot like a golf ball on a golf tee. It's a very large humeral head on a very small, very shallow socket. And that affords the shoulder six degrees of freedom, uh, and the shoulder actually has more range of motion than any other joint in the body. Uh, but those advantages to the architecture also come at a price. That means the inherent bony architecture of the shoulder is unstable. And that means that it's the soft tissue envelope around the shoulder and not the bony architecture that confers stability and function to the shoulder. And this becomes very important because uh, this is where we get all of our issues with our rotator cuff symptoms and a lot of the pain that we get in the shoulder with activities of daily living as well as with um, repetitive wear and tear and aging. So from a biomechanics standpoint, the more superficial muscles that we can all really easily identify, the deltoid, the pectoralis, latissimus dorsi, and teres major on the back, these are all the large muscle groups that actually affect that ability to put the arm through a large range of motion. You know, when you raise your arm over your head or when you push or pull a heavy object, you're primarily relying on these larger rotator cuff muscles. But the problem is that those muscles acting in isolation will not allow the shoulder to work properly because of that inherent bony instability of the shoulder joint. So that's where the rotator cuff comes in. Those four rotator cuff muscles, subscapular, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, surround the ball and socket joint and provide dynamic stability to the joint. They keep the humeral head centered on the socket while all of these larger surrounding muscle groups push and pull to rotate or bring your arm to a range of motion. Um, and they, they create this fixed fulcrum, which is so key to allowing that shoulder to uh, pivot and rotate. Um, for the most part, and to obviously oversimplify, um, a lot, the majority of the rotator, excuse me, the majority of the shoulder pain that we see is, uh, especially in patients over the age of 40, either going to be related to the rotator cuff, and that surrounding envelope, it's going to be related to arthritis, just wearing out of the actual cartilage surfaces, or a combination of the two, uh, which we often refer to as rotator cuff tear arthropathy, where someone has both worn out the rotator cuff and has lost the cartilage in the joint. So rotator cuff pathology is extremely prevalent in our population. 
Um, it accounts for over uh, 600,000 surgeries a year, actually, as of this year. Uh, it's almost 50% of all people over the age of 60 are going to, at some point, develop rotator cuff symptoms. Uh, and um, shoulder pain is one of the most common reasons, as you guys are all aware, uh, that your patients present to your office with musculoskeletal complaints. Um, in young patients, rotator cuff injuries are much less common, but when they do occur, they're almost always um, uh, traumatic. Uh, in the aging population, it's much more likely to be degenerative in nature. Uh, we recognize more and more as we understand the natural history better that much like arthritis, rotator cuff pathology develops over time simply as the result of the normal aging process. And so most rotator cuff pathology and most rotator cuff pain we see is not related to one specific traumatic event, but rather just overuse of the shoulder and wearing away of those tendons over time. So the problem with rotator cuff symptoms and the confusion with neck versus shoulder etiology is that most of the symptoms that your patient's going to present to in your office with shoulder pain are almost identical whether it's coming from the neck or the shoulder. Uh, rotator cuff pain often presents as pain localizing to the lateral deltoid. It often involves the periscapular muscles because those periscapular muscles are splinting or making accommodations to try and compensate for the non-functional rotator cuff, uh, and it causes pain at night. These are all uh, characteristics of the pain that we see with radiating symptoms from the neck as well. Um, as Brian already alluded to, tenderness to palpation at the shoulder is a good way to help sort this out, right? It makes sense if you poke the shoulder and it hurts, then there's some degree of pathology that is intrinsic to the shoulder. However, even that can sometimes not be as straightforward as you would like, because as Brian pointed out, uh, you know, the C5 nerve root innervates some of the rotator cuff muscles. So if you have weakness in the C5 nerve root distribution because the nerve is getting pinched, you're going to have weakness in your rotator cuff that will lead to subacromial impingement and that will cause pain at the shoulder. And it's not that you don't have true intrinsic shoulder pain, but if you fix the C5 radiculopathy and the weakness related to C5, the impingement symptoms would spontaneously disappear. So you can't always sort them out. And it's, not, it's usually not an either or, but there may be one of the two sources which is the predominant or the, or the, or the most influential uh, source. And we're often trying to figure out, okay, we know both are going on, but is it shoulder first and then neck, or is it neck first and then shoulder? So for these people, when they present with pain and they have had a significant trauma or have a profound functional deficit, we're pretty quick to jump to advanced imaging. Most often, um, uh, this is an MRI, uh, although we can use CT arthrograms. This is a poorly showing up picture of someone with a rotator cuff tear that was traumatic from a dislocation. Um, as I mentioned, you can use arthrograms to evaluate the rotator cuff in someone uh, who can't get an MRI, and we have ultrasound techniques too. In the absence of a significant trauma or a functional deficit, I don't usually jump to advanced imaging. We get an x-ray to make sure there's nothing obvious on x-ray, and the MRI or the advanced imaging can wait until later if they're failing conservative treatment measures like at least six weeks of physical therapy, rest, activity modification, use of non anti-inflammatories. So this story picks up uh, several years later. Um, same male, he initially declined or referral to a shoulder specialist. Uh, however, uh, the shoulder pain did get worse and progress, and so he eventually decided that he did want to come see someone about the shoulder specifically. Uh, he was reporting intermittent right shoulder pain. It used to be only with heavier activities, but now it's getting to the point where it's pain during the day and trying to sleep at night. He's using trazodone to try and sleep at night, uh, but it's still waking him up several times at night. He localizes the pain to the anterior lateral deltoid, wrapping around to the posterior deltoid, which is certainly a classic presentation for rotator cuff symptoms. Uh, he's tried two subacromial steroid injections, and they've been frustratingly inconclusive. They did help. So that suggests if you stab someone in, in the shoulder with a needle and you put medicine in the shoulder and the pain goes away, well, you think it's a shoulder problem. But it didn't help for as long as it should have. It only helped for about two days. So you don't really know 
uh, if that is corroborating or, or sort of uh, arguing against this being an intrinsic shoulder problem. On physical exam, he's tender in the rhomboids and the infraspinatus, so all those periscapular muscles that we talked about. Again, that could be neck, it could be splinting from the shoulder pain. He has full active range of motion and five out of five symmetric strength, left and right sides, and he has positive impingement signs. You put his arm all the way up over his head, he has a positive near sign, which means you know, his rotator cuff is tender. There seems to be some degree of real intrinsic shoulder problems here. And at this time, he has a normal distal neurologic exam. Um, I failed to do a cervical spine exam on him. Uh, I usually do when I'm suspicious about both people, but uh, uh, when I'm suspicious about a potential neck uh, contributing factor. Uh, but I was surprised when I went back and reviewed his chart again that on my first evaluation of him, I did not check his cervical spine range of motion, and I should have. His x-rays were normal to me. Um, I don't see any arthritis. I don't see any narrowing of the subacromial space or any fractures. So he had pain only, no trauma, no functional deficits. So this is definitely not something where I would jump to non-operative treatment. I, or excuse me, this is not something where I would jump to advanced imaging. I would start with non-operative treatment. We already got the x-rays. Uh, we ask him to rest and avoid specifically the provocative activities. And we put him through shoulder-specific six weeks of physical therapy. He's already had two steroid injections. I don't want to give him a third, but in general, you would talk about trying a sub subacromial steroid injection plus or minus the use of NSAIDs. So he comes back eight weeks later. He's still got, rot um, oh, okay, right. So, so he had these rotator cuff symptoms. We recommended physical therapy. We asked him to do this and return in about eight weeks. I typically tell people you have to invest at least six weeks in physical therapy when it comes to rotator cuff or shoulder issues before you know if it's going to work. Um, there are times when people will try it for two or three weeks and then they'll quit and, and come to me or come back to me. Um, and I almost always have to get them back in so that they've completed a six-week course. The first couple weeks of rehab for rotator cuff and shoulder issues is usually not going to be pleasant and it takes a couple weeks to turn the corner. So you really should have these people invest at least six weeks before you can have anyone render an opinion as to whether or not it's working or not. So we sent him for six weeks of physical therapy, told him to return in two months. Unfortunately, when he returns in two months, uh, he does not feel like the physical therapy has improved him. His range of motion is actually worse than at first evaluation, so he's losing function. At this point, uh, he has failed our initial attempts at physical therapy, and function is decreasing, so I did order MRIs, but not just of the shoulder. I ordered one of the C-spine as well. The MRI of the shoulder does show some mild multifocal cuff tendinosis, but no rotator cuff tear. You know, um, it does show a lateral acromion, which is downsloping, and abuts the supraspinatus. So you could argue that those things potentially suggest some intrinsic cuff issues. But really, if you compare them side by side, uh, the descriptions for the cervical spine are much more pronounced uh, than uh, what we're seeing in the shoulder, and especially the C5 and uh, through 7 canal stenosis with cord deformity at the C6-7 level uh, was um, suspicious for me that this was probably why his shoulder wasn't getting better. So at this place, at this point, I hand him back off uh, to neurosurgery and, uh, and Brian takes over again. So uh, we're now, interestingly, we're about five years out from initial, but about two years out from where we initially started with, uh, with seeing us, he's now 42. Uh, and this is not uncommon for people to kind of come back and continue to see us for a while. And, and, and really what I try to do is I try to drag my feet, make them sure they've really failed everything before we start putting incisions on them, especially with the, with the cervical spine and low back. Um, when we start talking about fusion, it, it does sometimes set us up for more problems in the future. Those problems uh, run about 10 to 20% of people will need another surgery on their spine within a decade after you've operated once. Some people will argue it's because the degenerative processes at other levels continue, makes some sense, that's, that's definitely true. But the other thing that's true is we definitely change the biomechanics of things once we've operated. And so I think it's a, pro it's a combination of both. But at this point, uh, intermittent, intermittent numbness in the biceps in the lateral form and, and to the thumb. So now it's maybe starting to make a little more sense. 
in terms of a, a nerve root <coughs> impingement syndrome in the cervical spine, continues to deny motor weakness, balance, bladder, and as you recall, has really tried everything to date. Uh, on exam, subtle weakness in the right bicep, and then mild, continued mild tenderness of the anterior shoulder capsule, and we repeated his imaging. And so, x-ray, lateral view, C2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, you can see now the spinous, so this is posterior, you can see now that he has a little bit more of a, if you remember that previous imaging, a little bit more of a disc osteophyte complex or a bone spur, which you can see a little more clearly now on the new MRI, so 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and it just appears like he's grown uh, a little bit more of some bone spurring. So the current, current uh, scan is on your left, the previous scan is on your right, and so over the years, he's just continually to slowly have grown this osteophyte, this bone spur, which has slowly started to compress the nerve that exits at this level, which is the C6 nerve, which makes sense now for some of the numbness going into his thumb. Um, we recommended, a, it's, it's nice to recommend an epidural steroid injection. Why these work long term in the face of uh, os, um, arthritis, I have no idea. I've just, but sometimes you get lucky with a hip, with a knee, with a, a, a cervical impingement syndrome. You inject somebody once, it's all they need, and they're off for the rest of their life. And I can't tell you who that is up front, but I always encourage people, patients to at least try it once. Usually it works for about three months, and then the, if it is, in fact, a pinch nerve, that will slowly come back. But every now and then, you'll get somebody that just gets enough relief. I think it has to do with just buying enough inflammation. And then I don't know if they just continue to get a little arthritic and they auto-fuse their spine in some position where they're no longer moving and that nerve just isn't irritated anymore, or if the nerve at some point just stops caring that it's pinched. In a way, I, I, it doesn't matter. They've dodged a surgery, so I always encourage people to at least try an epidural steroid. The way, we, uh, the way that that's done, though, it's done with a little bit of conscious sedation, so it is a little bit of a rigmarole. It's not something you can do in the office or I can do in the office. I'll refer them to somebody that does that locally. What they do is they start an IV, and it's kind of a little bit like having a colonoscopy. They'll uh, do a little propofol with anesthesiology, um, make them comfortable, and then under x-ray visualization, insert a nerve into the uh, foramina. They'll do a little bit of a dye study to ensure that the uh, nerve is, we're not into nerve, that they're outside of the nerve capsule, and then they'll uh, slowly infuse a combination of a local anesthetic and a steroid into that. The local anesthetic takes a uh, place right away, so when pe people come back to clinic, they'll oftentimes say it didn't work at all, and they'll say, well, did, it, did, you, did you feel better at least if you walked out of the office? And if they say yes to that, then I consider that a pretty good diagnostic study, and that they were kind of on the right track in terms of at least figuring out where their pain generator uh, was. So um, in this particular, they got a brief relief, and then it becomes to, you know, is there a surgery that we have to offer to unpinch the nerve? Uh, the surgical indications is life-limiting pain, which this uh, patient didn't particularly have. Pain greater than two months, which they definitely had. They've been kind of ongoing now, slowly getting worse. And then, or uh, progressive motor uh, deficit. And in this particular case, we didn't really notice any bicep weakness before, which we were noticing now. We have a choice in which way we do the surgery. So this is the sagittal MRI T2 weighted image. This is the uh, uh, front part of the throat. And so it goes uh, skin, esophagus, and trachea and then the spine, the spinal cord, and then the spinous processes, and then the skin on the back of the neck. And so we can either come through the front of the neck and take out the disc. It's a nice way to go because you actually are addressing the pathology directly. You can't get out the disc from the back because of the spinal cord. It's just one of those things we can't move. So you can't touch it from the back. You can't safely get at it from the back. What we can do from the back, though, is we can make the opening for the foramina bigger, for the nerve to exit bigger. So we indirectly can decompress that nerve by just making the space bigger. The way that that works is we just unroof the foramina. And so what it does is it allows the nerve to, root to float away from that, um, from that disc osteophyte complex. So our choices are an anterior cervical discectomy infusion, an artificial disc replacement, or a posterior cervical foraminotomy. For unilateral arm pain, for just one arm that hurts, I particularly like to do the, the, just the foraminotomy. It preserves motion. It doesn't uh, fuse anything. And then for if both arms are, are bothering them, I do tend to go from the front of the uh, cervical spine. Um, so we offered him a posterior C5-6 foraminotomy for unilateral arm pain because it saves motion. 
It does hurt more. This is a posterior incision, so uh, operating through the uh, large musculature of the cervical spine posteriorly really bothers patients. Going from the front doesn't hurt as much. There's not any muscles really in the front. There's the platysmus and the sternocleidomastoid. We don't, don't affect the sternocleidomastoid with an operation, but the platysmus doesn't really do much. And if you think about it, you don't, you don't really have to do much to flex your head. You just kind of let your head drop to flex forward. But you do a lot to keep it up. And so every time you get out of bed, you're always exercising these posterior cervical muscles just to keep this 10-pound weight up and um, positioned in space. So we, we went ahead and did the um, posterior cervical foraminotomy. It has about an 80-90% success rate. It does tend to leave people um, after uh, six months to a year. It does always seems that people will always have a little bit of numbness if you really push them. But usually the uh, arm pain is quite a bit better. And then long term, in terms of a stability standpoint, we haven't changed anything in terms of their biomechanics, in terms of flexion extension. We have changed pro uh, maybe a little bit of a stability issue because we have operated through some of the bone in the back and we have to remove some of the lamina and a little bit of the facet complex at some po uh, point. But we don't necessarily have um, a, a long term problem with instability in the cervical spine that we have in the lumbar spine. And that rate in the lumbar spine for instability after a microdiscectomy is roughly 10 to 20 percent in around 10 to 20 years. Uh, but we don't notice that in the cervical spine as much. So in this particular case, I uh, did uh, six-month follow-up, was doing extremely well. Um, we, at this point, will ask them to come back and see us uh, if anything else needs to be addressed in the future. His rate of needing us again at some point of his life in the early 40s is probably about 10 to 20 percent. Usually that would be at a, a problem at a different level because whatever degenerative process that's going on at C5-6 is also going on at C6-7. Now, thank you.